Hey everybody, this is Stella from the Shoot Style Sony here to bring you my classic pay-per-view review of the 70th anniversary show of the NWA. This is back from October of 2018 from the TNA Asylum over in Nashville, Tennessee. We got an eight-match card to go down. We're not going to include the pre-show because that wasn't on the live replay VOD on the NWA YouTube channel. So we're going to go through the main card, go through match by match. I'll review the bits and pieces, the memorable moments, and everything from it. I'll give it a star rating, and at the very end, we'll give the show a grade as a whole, and we'll also award the match of the night alongside the show MVP. Our broadcast team for this show, it is um, Jim Cornette and Joe Golly. Of course, this is before, well before I should say, the controversy surrounding Jim Cornette on NWA Power almost a little over a year later. They are also joined by Tony Schiavone before the show begins, but it is said that he will join the team in the main event of the evening, which is for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship match between Nick Aldis and Cody, but going back to the start of the show, we begin with a fatal four-way match in the NWA National Championship, kind of like a mini-tournament. It's a the way this is laid out is that there are two fatal four-way matches, one at the start of the night, one the later on, and the winners of the two will fight in a one-on-one -on -one match to crown the national champion. National championship, I think, was being brought back at this time, as we'll see later in the night, and this is how we're going to start the night. Our wrestlers in the first match are Samuel Shaw, now known as Dexter Loomis in WWE. We have Cole Cabana, who just signed up All Elite Wrestling. Also, Sammy Guevara, another All Elite Wrestling common face these days, along with Scorpio Sky of SCU. Um, before the match, we see two backstage interviews, one with Cole Cabana and then another with Sammy Guevara, the two talking about like what it means to be national champion and Sammy Guevara. Also coming up with like, some different um, monikers for himself before we knew him as what he is today as the Spanish God. He plays up the best ever, which we saw in the early days of AEW before he became a part of the inner circle. And then yeah, I think he's also called Mr. Money's Worth, if I'm not wrong there. And we also see Jen Decker doing interviews, who is now a backstage personnel and all elite. So it's very interesting to see like where all these talents have gone from here when you look back now in 2020. Like seeing all these people, the career paths they've gone on. It's always like a nice little thing to see in the show. We then see a brief Scorpio Sky video of him talking about being a national champion. Like he wants to carry the honor, like of how Cody carries a 10 pounds of gold and defends it from show to show. And he wants to follow that with the NWA national title. It also shows him training in like a mixed martial arts setting. And it's all around pretty nice package. We don't see a vin vignette for Samuel Shaw as he's being shown as like this very ominous, dominant figure who doesn't need his words to be spoken with action, so we just go right into the match. We start off the match, and early on we see Colt, Sammy, and Scorpio Sky show off some agility early on. A couple flips from all three, and I think notably at one point Colt bounces off the ropes. It's like a nice thing. It's kind of like a sent on to them. It's a pretty nice moment. Uh, the big thing in this match is how they get over two things. One, Sam, uh, Sammy Guevara's ability to fly around the ring and just to do about any crazy spot. We see an early spot on where he goes for a moonsault off the apron, and him and Sky, I think, yeah, he goes for a moonsault off the apron, and him and Sky are going to go back in the ring because he misses the moonsault. I think he lands on his feet. And then they go back into the ring, and he still hits a drop kick on Scorpio Sky from Sammy. It's a very nice moment there. Uh, Samuel Shaw getting involved now. He hits a fallaway slam to Sky, and then he hits one on Sammy. He's looking really good early on. And the big thing that happens on commentary is that both Cornette and Joe Galli are really bigging up the dominant force that Samuel Shaw is. Like, we already know how mysterious he is because he didn't really talk much at all backstage, and now we're showing him in action, and it shows how dominant he is looking to be in this Invitational. Uh, Kamana gets back involved in the match, and he does the Chris Statlander boob. He boops uh, Shaw on the nose. Shaw doesn't take kindly to that. They get into it. A little bit of a scuffle. And then Samuel Shaw, I think, goes for a hit with his glove. But as he has his hand on his face, Kamana bites down on the glove. So they're in the corner. Um, he eventually gets the glove off, as I said. He then slaps all three men with it, which is pretty funny. I think Cornette makes like a joke of, like, is that a loaded glove or something like that? And it's a pretty nice moment. But eventually the ref takes it away. It gets a lot of heat. And then we go back to the action. We see a super kick party from um, all three all three of the other men onto Samuel Shaw. I feel like Sammy Guevara is kind of working babyface here at some points. You know, he's very... He's having very explosive bits of offense, and the crowd is super into the guy. So I feel like he's working a little bit of babyface, but like the pre-match promo makes me think otherwise. Cabana then is going to eat a double super kick from Sammy, and then Sammy takes out Scorpio Sky with his own super kick. They fight for a little more. Uh, they then see a 450 to the outside from Sammy, which was a great shot there. He's getting ready to do a dive, but then Samuel Shaw sneaks in from the other side of the apron, grabs Cabana, hits a power bomb, and then he eliminates Cole Cabana. Cole Cabana is the first man eliminated from the match. He eventually then gets taken out by Shaw. Sky gets back in the ring, and then he hits a Shining Wizard on Sammy. Sammy Guevara's been eliminated now. But then almost immediately after, we see Samuel Shaw pretty much just hit a Shining Wizard, and that's the match. Samuel Shaw wins. It's a very fast-paced and explosive 
explosive match. And it's a lot of, there is a lot of great spots for Sammy that we are, we, of course, we see now in AEW. And a big thing that I, I really liked about this match alongside that is just having how well all four guys work together. Like, it's a very, it's a very fun match, as I said. And Shaw especially looked very dominant, and he played the strategic, conniving heel. But it was a good opener. It's a lot of fun. It's not that long. It's only about like, just under eight minutes. But it's a very, it's a very fun eight minutes. I'm going to give it three stars out of five. I thought it was a very good match. And it's a nice little way to start the show. In your second match of the evening, we see Laredo Kid, who I last saw at Fighter Fest in All Elite Wrestling, taking on Barrett Brown, someone I was not familiar with going into the show. I can't remember if there was much of a story going into this match, because, you know, I didn't. I went to the show a bit blind when I watched it, I didn't watch most of the angles. The only angle I really knew about was the main event picture, which we will get to later. But, you know, it's a very... He's two. It's a lot two younger guys. I, mean, I know Laredo Kid better because of the Fighter Fest match, but this is a. It's a very. It's a very like keeps the narrative going of being the whole flippy aspect of the show. Excuse me. Uh, so early on in this match, we see Laredo Kid show off a lot of his agility in the early stages. He throws Barry to the outside and does a great uh, springboard moon so He hits a lot of distance on this too. So like, I think he goes from like the apron, like where he took the dive, all the way up to like to the start of the ramp. He goes really far, and they eventually do get the spot. It actually looks pretty nice. Uh, they they go for another. So Kid goes for another springboard from the corner, but he hits a drop kick from Brown. So Brown starts to get back into the match. He slowly starts to like bring things down a little bit, and then we see a nice cannonball senton from Brown in the corner. It's a nice spot there. Uh, uh, Kid Lear sets up Brown on the top rope. He goes to the... So Kid goes to the other... So yeah, so they're both in the corner. We see Laredo Kid set up uh, Barrett Brown on one side of like, the turnbuckle. Like, so it's like it's like, a, it's like an L shape. Uh, Brown's on one side of it. And then Kid gets... Kid's get, yeah, Laredo Kid's on the other side. And he hits a great springboard cutter uh, for another near fall. So it's a, it's a, like I said, it's a very worker heavy match right now. Lots of high spots, lots of flips. But it's a, it's very fun. Uh, Kid eventually goes for the corkscrew off the top. Brown moves out of the way and he hits. I thought it was a V trigger, but it's uh, it's kind of like he doesn't get like the full height like, like Kenny Omega does. But he nails the shining wizard and that's the match. So another match where it ends with like a shining wizard or a knee strike and there we go. Uh, it's a good back and forth match. It's it keeps that like I said it keeps that narrative of having flips going on and have a very work and hairy match, which is like the total opposite of what we see in the NWA now these days. And Cormac's commentary really just shows that, because he doesn't really, like, is a fan of this stuff, as we as we know he's a very polarizing figure when it comes to this. But it's still an enjoyable match. Uh, as for a star rating, I believe I, w- I wrote it down as... Three, yeah, three and a quarter stars, so three point two five stars out of five. I thought it was a very fun match. I thought I liked it a little more than the opener because of the action and how smooth it looked. But still, it's not to say either match was bad. It was all, all in all, pretty good. In the second Fatal 4-Way matches for the NWA National Championship, we have Willie Mack taking on Jay Bradley, Ricky Starks, and Mike Perro. Um, like like the first match, we get a lot of vignettes before the match. We see two interviews again from Jen Decker. We see a video package of, I think it was Mike Perro talking about, you know, him coming up through all his different stuff he did in his life and how he hypes up how he is a gay man in wrestling, which is a, it's a very nice little video package. But my favorite thing about this, I think, is the whole presentation of Ricky Starks. Ricky Starks... You know, he's, we know him more today as, like, the young upstart babyface who recently was NWA television champion and had a nice little reign before, unfortunately, losing to the Zicky Dice on power, which I wasn't a fan of the title change, and I thought they had a lot in, in mind for Starks as TV champion. But back here, he's working as a heel, and his video package, it do, you, I can see, like, the wrinkles of the Ricky Starks we know today in this video package, but, you know, it shows, like, a couple things that I thought were pretty nice. It, start, it shows Starks training, like, him just doing, practicing his moveset in, like, an empty wrestling ring in a training facility. It shows him on the roof of a car. He's posing on it, like, very seductively, and it's pretty funny. He's putting on a necklace in one with, like, this really, like, spaghetti, it's, like, strap, like, white tank. Like, like a woman would wear and he's also it shows him in his living room with like this, these, this nice like 80s music playing in the background it's a very retro feeling vignette and i like it a lot and as i said it just shows um the wrinkles of what we would see of the ricky starks of today Starks, um, it, it shows like he's very much like in over his head right now. He's very being very arrogant. He's you know he thinks he's just better than all these guys. And even like the stuff he does, like the hosses don't really care. It. Uh, Pero eventually goes for a choke slam on Starks, but Starks counters it into this pin, and he gets the three count. So Mike Pero has been eliminated. It's only been like a couple minutes into this match, but however, there's some controversy on commentary as Cornette plays up that his shoulder actually was up, but the ref couldn't see it. I think this was meant to happen in Cafe because they were really making a big deal. Then there was a replay afterwards. Pero was. Sh- limited but you know it's too late for the ref to change his mind in the kayfabe and this is confirmed on replay then you know his shoulder actually looks like it came up but they're not going to reverse his decision at this point so ricky starks eliminates mike Perro. it's a big moment for starks as we, we all i thought going into that he would be probably eliminated right away considering the people in the ring 
but Bradley sets up for, I think it's going to be a dive, but Mac intercepts it. Mac hits a head buck, and then, head butt, hits, head said buck, and Mac and Starks team up. Starks hits a great, um, like, I think it's like a sit-out powerbomb from the top, and then you see Willie Mac hit a five-star frog splash. Jade Bradley's been eliminated. It was a very great sequence, so it's down to Ricky Starks and Willie Mac. Starks then goes for, we know it today as the stroke, but back then it was called the Buster Keaton, but Mac, Mac counters this, and we see a few exchanges from Mac and Starks, and we eventually see, like, I think Starks runs in front of Mac, but then Mac hits the stunner, and he gets the win. I thought this was a great showing for Ricky Starks. It shows, like, how versatile he is and how, like, um, strategic he was as the heel in this match. Other than that, this was a pretty standard match. There's nothing crazy, too crazy about it. I'm going to give it two and a half stars out of five. I thought it was, it did its job. I would have liked to see a little bit more from William McIntyre from, like, the ending stretch, but we'll see why later on the night that was probably conserved. We're not done here, though, because after the match, Jen Decker is interviewing William Mack at ringside, but he's quickly interrupted by Samuel Shaw. I think... Mac throws a jab at Samuel Shaw, saying he's going to beat that crazy mofo later in the night. But as they stare each other down, Jay Bradley attacks once more. He comes back to ringside. He takes him out. And who should make the save other than James Ellsworth? <sighs> like, look, all the stories we've known about James Ellsworth now these days just make me look back on him not very fondly. But he tries to make the save for Mac, but then eventually he just helps him to the back. And that's the segment. In your next match of the evening, it is the perfect Storm, Tim Storm, taking on the professional, or the producer, whatever he was called in back at this time, Peter Avalon, now known today as the librarian in all elite wrestling. Uh, before the match, we see a vignette hyping up the match. It shows that the previous two encounters in some Arizona independence scene. It shows them working on a show together. It shows Tim Storm snapping. We see this dark side of Tim Storm that we don't really see in NWA power, because we see him as this very over baby face who has a very good connection to the crowd. He's, you don't see him do stuff like this now these days basically it shows how avalon's been able to play some mining games with tim storm tim storm snaps and takes him out with the chair gets some dq from the match and then another time avalon tries to tease the chair shot into the match but it actually proves to be tim storm's downfall as he gets the roll up went on him but he gets his foot on the ropes and here we are today nwa 70 uh before the match avalon's cutting a heel promo on the crowd he does do a local sports team promo which i which i was worrying because he does that a lot these days in all elite wrestling but he tells him he tells he goes about how he's gotten over on tim storm he doesn't know why he's fighting him again because he's 2-0 on him already storm tim storm comes out during avalon's entrance like he doesn't come out to his own music so he just walks down to the ring like on his own storm rebuttals and he says that the Loser must kiss the winner's foot. Uh, Avalon easily accepts this. It should also be noted that Avalon has a valet in Nico Marquez. Not related to Dave Marquez, I'm pretty sure. But I didn't know much about this guy. I'd never seen him before. But hey, he's got a, he's got a valet. And it's not Leva Bates. So let's see where this goes. Um, it's, it's kind of a one-sided match. It's mostly just Storm overpowering Avalon early on. He's catching a lot of Avalon. Of, I think I, yeah, this is what it was. This is a nice spot. It's that he catches both of Avalon's like strikes he goes for, and he like yells in his face. It's a nice moment. The Samoan drop, but it's a weird one because he he falls back to the Samoan drop, but Avalon, the way he takes it, looks odd, and he just quickly rolls out of the ring. I couldn't tell if this was a botch or if it was just what was meant to happen. It was a very weird moment, but then they head to the outside. Avalon gets advantage of this. He throws Tim Storm into the post, and he goes for a and he goes for a dive for a near fall into the ring. Athlon then eventually grabs the chair, which is hyped up in the video as I talk about, but the ref takes it away. However, at the same time as this, Nico Marquez gets on the apron, he's yelling at the referee, and then he gets involved with Storm, but Storm, after like a punch, Storm takes him out, and then Avalon doesn't really get much heat from this. He usually, Tim Storm takes advantage again, he hits this beautiful looking perfect Storm, his finisher, and that's the match. It's a pretty short match, it's not too much, it's only about like, I think like five or six minutes, but we're not done here, as after that Storm Storm gets the chair that Avalon introduced to the match, and he, he sits down in it like you normally would. And he starts unlacing his boots because he wants to get ready for Avalon to kiss his foot. Avalon, very much not having any of this, he gets a mic again, and he talks about how he may have lost, and he, he'll agree. Yeah, he said, a deal's a deal. And he's, he looks at um, Nico Marquez, and he says, he, he wants, he says, oh, you're going to do it, basically. And the crowd does not like this at all. They're very much booing this because they knew that he lost. He pretty much just, like, doesn't want to do it. Marquez quickly walks over. He kisses Tim Storm for, like, for, like, a millisecond. Walks away, and he's grossed out. The way he sung this is pretty hilarious. But in Tim Storm having none of this, annoyed, he grabs Avalon from behind by the hair, drives Avalon's face into his foot, mushes it around, and that's the feel-good moment. I'm going to give this whole segment two and a half stars. The match isn't really much. It's only, like, it's just, it's kind of like a glorified squash match. Tim Storm looks great. Um, I think... It's pretty standard stuff. Not too much. Uh, it's just the wrap-up of the story, and it's a good babyface ending.
In your NWA Women's World Championship match, we see the champion Jazz, obviously a WWE alumni, a very recognizable figure in added, like ruthless aggression women's wrestling, taking on Penelope Ford, who we now know is a super bad girl. Uh, some vignettes before the match, showing up a little bit of Penelope Ford's background and what she's all about. Then we see Jazz talking about how she won't let someone like Penelope Ford like take it from her and how she will be the dominant one in this match. Um, so obviously, Penelope Ford's working babyface here, which is... Odd considering what she's up to now these days. And then we see Jazz as the dominant heel champ. This is before Jazz shaved her head, so I was expecting her to be bald, but not just yet. Um, early on, we see Ford, like, really just, like, show, like, most of, like, her, her skill set. And Ford nails his handspring cutter in, in the ring, but she only gets a near fall. Uh, Penelope Ford keeps the momentum going. She hits a Northern Light Suplex for another near fall. Commentary is starting to play up, but Jazz has gotten her bell rung early on because Jazz is having a hard time getting into the match in the first couple minutes. She has, yeah, because Penelope Ford's really, like, impressing early on with all her agility-based, gymnastics-focused offense. But Jazz slowly gets back into it. Uh, she hits, like, a chicken wing thing. It's kind of like a glance in, but she doesn't, like, go all the way down. She kind of just, like, lets go without, like, falling down with Penelope Ford. She then taunts, and, but then after that, she pans. But Ford kicks out, so Jazz's hubris is kind of costing her the way to win for a bit. But still, Jazz maintains control. She takes Penelope Ford to the outside. She gets her on the apron, so she drips her on the apron, hits a running knee, but Ford is still able to kick out. Some more hope spots from Penelope Ford. She gets a, a handspring bridge pin which is a nice moment kind of like a very Zack Sabre Jr. Sonata sort of thing it looks like Jazz is about to win but Earl Hebner the ref he counts to two and then on the, on the three count does he like inadvertently hit Jazz does he is there a botch here it's a very, very odd moment, but it kind of takes me out of that. I thought that was it, because it was a great-looking Mission Noku drive. I thought that was the finish, but no, Jazz is very much annoyed at this point. She locks in a very brutal-looking STF, bends Penelope Ford back, Ford taps out, and that's the match. I'm going to give it two stars out of five. After this match, we see Penelope Ford, uh, not, not Penelope Ford, uh, Jazz get interviewed by at ringside. She talks about how she wants a shot at 10 pounds of gold, but eventually, as we know, Jazz would be gone from the NWA, I think in the spring of next year, where she would have to vacate the title due to, I think it was either booking or something else was going on in her life, and then the title was eventually passed down to, I believe it was now given to Allison K, who held the belt into NWA power, and then she eventually lost the title at the start of the year to Thunder Rosa at hard times. In the culmination of the NWA National Championship uh, Invitational, we have the final, which is the championship match between Lily Mack and Samuel Shaw. Before the match, Jim Cornette gets into the ring. He introduces Jeff Jarrett. He comes down. He has the NWA National Championship with him. Jeff Jarrett just talks about like his history in the business, his um, relationship with the NWA, and he talks about how the NWA National title will be the stepping stone to the 10 pounds of gold. It's a very nice promo, and Jeff Jarrett gets a nice reception because this is the TNA Asylum, so it's nice to see him back in that arena. Pretty standard stuff. Uh, Samuel Shaw then comes out, but but as his entrance, he is jumped by Willie Mack before the bell. So it's a bit of a receipt for what happened earlier in the night to Mack as Shaw attacked him alongside Jay Bradley. So it's nice to see a little bit of comeuppance from what happened earlier in the show. Uh, is still very dominant, even though Mack is slowly trying to get back into the match. He's the babyface who's coming who's trying to come from behind, whereas Shaw is the dominant uh, strategic heel again. So this time he gets he gets him, he has been the same spot. I think he's he's got him in a headlock this time compared to the trap lock. And then it happens again and it gets an even bigger pop when he goes for the three count again. The crowd's very much behind William Mack at this point. Um, so the two, they fight some more. Shaw gets caught off the ropes with Exploder Suplex for Mac. So Shaw runs the ropes. He gets caught by Mac, Exploder Suplex, and then Mac gets him back up. He hits a, spin, a spinning scoot slam, which looked awesome. Then he nails a ring let drop. Mac is all over the place at this point. It's a lot of fun to watch. Well, Shaw then goes up top for the Swanton, but he, a Swanton bomb, but he misses. Mac then takes the opportunity of this, hits the stunner, but that's not it great near fall because we haven't really seen like a, a lot of near falls tonight so it's, it's the use of the near fall in the show i think is very good because it's so sparse that it makes you like have that believe oh the match is actually over he hit his finisher but no that's not the case here mac then needs a super kick but he kicks out shaw this is where shaw gets a lot of heat he starts to tune up the band in nashville this gets a lot of heat as they don't like the disrespect done to Shawn michaels here he misses the sweet chin music and mac hits a stunner again and willie mac wins the match it's a very feel-good moment for willie mac he would hold the national title for a while i think he would then lose it to james Storm, if I'm not mistaken. I forget because James Storm was the champion hand at NWA Power. I'm not sure if it was him or somebody else that won the national title off of him. I, I probably will need to look it up in a bit. But that's the match. It's a very fun, explosive match. I think I found it a lot of fun. I'm going to give it 3.75 stars out of 5, or 3 and 3 quarters, I should say. A lot of fun. It's a very feel good moment for William Mack. It's a story that arcs throughout the night as well. It's nice to see a nice little payoff. 
In your semi-main event, it is the Kingdom of Josephus taking on a team accompanied by a Road Warrior Animal. Uh, before the match, we see Joseph. Well, we see Road Warrior Animal come out. He is, then brings out the War Kings of Crimson and Jack Stane. Jack Stane is a former NWA World Heavyweight Champion, and Crimson I know from his time in TNA. So he's good. He's back in the asylum if he was ever there before. It's a nice time. And then we see the Kingdom of Josephus come out. Uh, Josephus cuts, cuts a promo before the match, introducing these two women who are behind him. One's a bald woman who was called his spiritual advisor i didn't hear her name shannon moore and crazy steve jumped the workings in the ring this way up on commentary and the bell rings um the match is pretty standard they fight for theirs they fight for a little bit working slowly work their way back into the match and at, at the same time we see josephus and the two women at ringside standing there road warrior animals just also just watching uh they get cut off by it but eventually they take care of one of the one of the men in the face to take care of the recruits and then they simply win the match now with the doomsday device with another finisher i forget what it was but that's pretty much it but then after the match we see Ant, we see Cornette walk down, he interviews World Warrior Animal, and they play up his history as a tag team wrestler. They then announce the Crockett Cup for 2019. This is where we saw um, the, the villain, uh, where we saw Villain Enterprises win the Crockett Cup over the Wild Cards. I think there were NWA World Tag Team Champions after this for a little bit before dropping the belts to the Wild Cards for power was a thing. We also saw Allison K win the Women's World Championship at this show from Santana Garrett before Santana Garrett signed with WWE. So, yeah, that's some stuff from that event. As for the match itself, I'm only going to give it one and a half stars. I think it was the weakest match of the show. And it really wasn't much. The whole angle made sense going into the match of Josephus bringing in these new recruits, but they were just handled really easily. Plus, like, Josephus and the ladies walked out on the match is what commentators had to play up. So it was a weird match. It was only, like, not even five minutes. It was pretty standard stuff. I wasn't really that into it. In your main event of the evening, it is the rematch from All In. It is the 2 out of 3 falls match for the 10 pounds of gold. The challenger, the national treasure, Nick Aldis taking on the American Nightmare, the world champion, Cody. Before the match, we see we saw some vignettes throughout the night talking about how Aldis had the choice to bar Brandy from ringside, but he chose not to because, you know, I think he said like, he respects Brandy and he didn't want to take the easy way out. So he then he says, well, if Cody can bring someone down to ringside. I may as well get an insurance policy. And the camera in this promo, he's like, he's just sitting in a room, basically. It's like a nice room. It pans out, and you see these nice women's legs. We don't know who this is just yet. And the commentary picks this up, like, oh, who is it? Who could it be? Who is this woman? Uh, and then this is where Tony Schiavone joins commentary for this match, because he was only be a, being able to join for the main event. And we eventually see all this Vegas entrance, and his valley is revealed as Camille, who we know very well today on NWA Power. This match marks the first time Camille served as all of his valet, or in his words, his insurance policy. So it's, it's nice to see this is how our NWA debut took place. Uh, early on, it's lots of feeling each other out. Cody eventually ducks out of the ring. He shares a moment with Brandy and the fans. He gives he, he hugs one of the fans, which I think is a nice moment. They fight for a little bit more. All this drop kicks Cody out of the ring, and then he mocks Cody's muscle pose for some nice heel heat. Commentary Terry early on is bigging up is bigging up Cody's back as all is focusing on it a lot so far and that talks about how that plays into his finisher the King's Lynn Texas Cloverleaf he's also working some of the leg but not as much as the back um, they get back to the ring Cody's starting to slowly get back into it he counters a well he, out of the corner court uh, Cody hits a power slam for a near fall so he doesn't get that he then goes for the disaster kick gets that for another near fall they fight for a little more. Cody is going, his looks like he's about to get put in a leg lock by Aldis, but he reverses that and turns it into a figure four. And crowd's getting super into it now. Aldis tries to power out. He flips him over one time, and then Cody reverses it again. He gets the pressure back on his side. They flip around a couple times, reversing the pressure to each other. But like after, like I'd say, like a minute or so, Cody goes for another disaster kick after this, but Aldis quickly turns it into the King's Lynn as a reversal, and Cody immediately taps out. And this is played up on Connor as a really good strategy because it allows Cody to quickly recover. He was in the submission for too long, so he was able to get right back up to his feet for the one-minute rest period, and Aldis sits just like slouches in the corner, just showing how much that first fall actually took out of him. So... Going into the second fall, the one minute break happens. The commentary, like I said, they're picking up how tired all this is and how fired up Cody is. So the contrast between each other, which is weird considering that the score is a total opposite of how the wrestlers are feeling right now. All this immediately backs out of the ring as Cody charges at him. He walks around the ring for a bit. He takes a breath. He gets, he gets a drink of water, which is a nice little moment there. But amongst the as he walks over to the ramp area, Cody dives onto all this. He gets a big suicide dive. They fight for a little more, and all this eventually goes into the crowd. And then Cody notices is this he starts to take a lap around the ring to do a big dive but he is intercepted by Camille the insurance policy already starting to pay dividends in this match protecting all a little bit from this and the stare down here just shows like how tall and like how 
imposing Camille is because she's almost the same height as Cody. But to be fair, she is wearing heels. You do see you do see on camera that she is wearing high heels, so it's like oh okay, it's a bit a little bit of like oh right, so it's not as like crazy as we thought. But so it shows like how her intimidating prowess and I think it helps get Camille over early on, just like how the threat of her she is going to be in like the later days of NWA. All this sets up for a big corner bump as Cody like leans on the table for a breather for a moment, but as he's about to run, Brandy gets in the way. And as they as all the stops, Camille then evens the odds for all this as they're as they're arguing with each other. All this then uses the stare down as Camille steps out of the way. He, he's able to take down both Cody and Brandy. It's kinda of like a bump, like he doesn't hit Brandy, but he bumps into Cody in a way that it makes both of them fall over and it gets some genuine heat from the crowd. Uh, as this all happens, the ref gets rid of the table, and the crowd boosts us a lot, And but all this then takes the table, he brings it over to the ramp, he sets it back up, he puts Cody on it, and the table is very much already like, um, what's the word I'm looking for, dipping a bit, it's like, it's like, it's like already ready to break, it's like probably how it was sought up before the show. All this then sets up for the big elbow drop. He goes for it, but Cody moves out of the way, and it's a brutal-looking bump for Alice. His knees hit the ground pretty hard. It looks, like looks like that was the worst part of the fall for him. Cody then gets uh, all this back into the ring. He hits a crossroads, and Cody gets the second fall in the match. So Cody, like a house of fire again, he's really fired up for this one. He hits a super kick right away, but all this reverses the crossroads. He like kind of shoves him off into the corner. Cody goes for a moonsault, but he misses that as well. No water in the pool, as Joe Guy likes to play up. Um, so Brandy is leading. So now at this point brandy starts leading into the ring to try and help cody but then camille eventually drags her out tensions rise between the two and camille walks back around the ring to where all this is and then we see brandy not take kindly she walks around the ring too and she jumps on camille's back here kind of like a rear naked choke sort of like hold tensions rise and eventually this gets too out of hand before the nwa champions come by all of them walk by try to break things up it's a lot of chaos right now commentary makes it up to how distracting this is from the actual match uh, they eventually go focus back on the ring, get back into the ring. Cody and Alice fight for a little bit more. Alice gains control, and he steals the crossroads from Cody. Big moment there, and and like it wasn't a bad looking crossroad. Yet. I think Cody sold it really well. Cody kicks out. But I, thought, I actually thought that was gonna be the finish for a second. I haven't seen this match in full before, but no. Cody then eventually fights back in when he steals the King's Lynn. It wasn't great looking because Cody didn't really sit down, which I think Cornette mentioned he had to sit down to get more pressure on him. It was either him or Shivani that played it up, and it's a great like it's you know it's their it's a psychological that they take each other's take each other's moves to try and embarrass them on the final fall. Cody then eventually calls for like a finish. He's ready to like do like a something for that, but all this catches him. I think he went for the moon salt again. But all this catches him and he turns into an and into a great looking tombstone. It's kind of like the leaping taker one from 25, of course, like not as iconic, but it still looks really good. All this then sets up for the King's Lynn uh, Cloverleaf, but he actually rips off Cody's boot. So all this throws throws the boot out of the ring at that point. He heads over to the ropes, but Cody then goes to roll up how he wanted all in. Alls reverses that back to him, and that's it, and that's the match. Alls gets the three count and is the new NWA World Heavyweight Champion. And this is not, and this is like any other match that would have been kind of deflating, but given how All In wrapped up with, the, with like the similar, a similar kind of finish, I thought this was a very good storytelling moment, and it, it helped like capitalize the match. It could have, I kind of would have preferred if it was like a more decisive way to end the match. I still thought this was a very good way to end this one. <clears throat> And that, and then after that, Alice gets the ten pounds of gold back. He holds it up. That's him on the show. Cody walks back up the ramp. Brandy's there. Camille walks back down to celebrate with Alice. And then we fade to black, and that's the show. Um, as for a match grade, this is a hard one to tough. I personally give it four and three quarter stars out of five. I thought this match had pretty much everything that you would want out of like a big deal wrestling match. It had all the classic wrestling spots. You had all like the traditional storytelling. You had the psychology in it. You had the interference from the women managers and you had the involvement of the NWA alumni or former net uh, former world champions and the whole the whole crowd elements of it the crowd was super into it the crowd brawling the use of the trash can the table the chair the concession stand and all that I thought that was all i thought it was all really knit into this great like near 40 minute match and i thought it was just an awesome and all the storytelling reasons from previous encounters everything leading up to it the introduction of camille for a new debut and all in all i just thought it was a great total package as it was and I think this match tree probably deserved more credit to it because it's one I don't really hear about much these days. And to this day, Nick All still holds that NWA World Heavyweight Championship. And originally, he was going to defend it against Marty Skrull at the Crockett Cup this coming month, well, later, later this month, because it is April 1st at the time of recording. But that, unfortunately, has been postponed to a later date given current circumstances. But hopefully, we'll see that match one day. And will it be the end? We'll have to see because we don't know right now. 
My final grade for NWA 70 is going to be a B plus. I thought the show was pretty good from top to bottom. There were some high points and low points. My match in line obviously goes to the main event. And the show MVP is kind of hard to decipher because there were a lot of good showings for a lot of the men. Namely, both men in the main event. William Mack had a great night. Ricky Starks had a great showing in his match. And uh, Samuel Shaw had a great showing overall. But if I had to give an award for one person, I'm probably going to have to give it to Nick Aldis. Considering the performance he gave in the main event and then the whole feat of winning back the 10 pounds of gold from Cody and currently holding it till this day as one of the most recognizable men in the NWA and as the resurgence of the NWA. So MVP is going to go to all of us, but it wasn't an easy choice to make. And it was just a generally a really good show as a whole. So I hope you all enjoyed my review of NWA 70 here on the Shoot Style Sauna channel. Next time we'll figure out what the next classic pay review is going to be. Excuse me. Also look out for the State of the Sauna address coming from me, which will be a separate, which will be a separate video in its own right. But as for now, I'm self for the Shoot Style Sauna, and we'll see you next time.